Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your goodness in our lives. Thank you that we get to come into the house of God openly and freely, Lord. Thank you that we get to lift our hands and our hearts, lift our voices to you tonight, God. And Lord, what a joy it is to be in your presence. God, tonight as we open up your word, we pray that you would open it up to us. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear, hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, at no time do we uh, just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches that are preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as the, around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. And God, we bless them tonight. God, bless all of our Baptist and Lutheran, Methodist, Episcopalian, Charismatics, and Pentecostal brothers and sisters, Lord. We thank you for Calvary Chapel and Harvest, Oak Valley. God, for the well and the way, for Ecclesia and Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, God, for the assemblies. And for the four square denominations, God, for all of our Catholic and Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord, all those that are lifting up the name of Jesus, God, preaching your gospel, we bless them, God, as you would bless us this night, as you would lead us and guide us into your truth. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. You can have a seat tonight and go ahead and get your Bibles out and go with me to the book of Galatians. I want to talk to you about fruitful parenting. Tonight. This is the parenting series continuing on, and I believe it's part number four. I think we've had uh, Pastor Jim, Pastor Deborah came and ministered a couple of times, and tonight, uh, tonight we'll stand alone. Tonight we'll also reinforce some of the things that you've already heard in this parenting series. I want to give a shout out to my mom and dad. Today they've been married for 40 years, and I don't know if they're watching the live stream tonight or what they're doing, but um, just... Just a neat example, and so if you know them, just pat them on the back next time you see them and, and tell them good job. They were just a great example uh, to myself and my brother, and, and just growing up, just watching them. Yes, we had ups and downs. Yes, there was stuff that went on. Yes, there was things that took place that, uh, you know, we, we don't want to talk about. But you know what? That's family, and that's part of life, and that's part of learning and growing. And, and you can see from my parents' perspective after 40 years that there was some fruit. You know, obviously myself and my brother uh, contributing to society and doing what we do. Uh, just neat to see the, the prayers that I know my mama was praying for me. You know, that I would not be who I am or doing what I do without those prayers. I know the wisdom that my dad imparted to me. And so the, the life of a parent in, in any child is so important. It's vital. God developed it, God planned it, God wants it that way. And so tonight, if you're here and you're saying, you know, but Pastor Dan, I'm a single parent, or Pastor Dan, you know, listen, God will come in and he will take that other position there in your home, and he will make up for what is lacking in your home. And if you're two together, but you feel like one, hey, listen, God knows how to get a hold of them too, and God will take care of that too as you entrust it to the Lord. You there in Galatians? Galatians chapter 5. Remember, we're talking about fruitful parenting. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 22 and verse number 23. The apostle Paul's writing in Galatian church, and he says, you guys need to walk in the Spirit. Now, take a look at what happens when we walk in the Spirit. Verse 22 of Galatians chapter 5 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such. There is no law. Now, if your translation says something different, maybe you, you saw some different words in there, or maybe you saw the same words just mixed around, uh, just know that I was reading from the old King James Version, the KJV, okay? Uh, I heard it said that that's the Bible that God uses. I don't know. But look at that again. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. See, if we're going to parent... And if we're going to raise children, I don't know about you, but the moment that my daughter came into this world, I have three children. I have a nine-year-old, I have a six-year-old, and I have a three-year-old about to turn four in April. He's our little Easter baby. He came out on Easter morning. And uh, there was an earthquake, and someone in our church passed away on the same day. It was a pretty big day. So, um, but I, I remember when my daughter came out, and, and just the amazing miracle that had taken place, and then on the car ride home, just going, God, I... I me? You know, I'm, I'm still the kid here, God, and now I'm, I'm having children. You know, anybody as a parent ever felt inadequate? 
I mean, think about it for a second. God has just entrusted to you a life. There was times that I would hold my children, and, and especially when, uh, uh, before I even had children, somebody would ever get around me with a baby, and it was almost like I was walking on eggshells. You know, I didn't want to break them. And, and, and uh, my wife and, and her sister uh, would hand me their, my nephew, James, and they would just put him in my hand and say, here, hold him for a second. I'd be like this, you know? An hour later, they would come back, and I'd still be like this. Why? Because I didn't know what to do. I, I, I felt inadequate with my children. I, there's often times where they bring me things or they, they do things and I feel like, Lord, I, I just don't got this. You got, you got to step in, God. But God says, walk in the Spirit. And as you walk in the Spirit, the natural production of walking in the Spirit is fruit. And Jesus wants us to live a fruitful life. Jesus wants us to have a, a life of fruit, but not only fruit, but fruit that remains. And so as we walk in the Spirit, as we, as we endeavor to stay in the Spirit of God, the things that will be produced in and through us by the Spirit of God is this list of things. And let me tell you something. If you focus and if you look at what the Word of God has to say for your life and you endeavor to walk in the Spirit, these things will be produced naturally. You know, you don't have to tell a tree to be a tree. Is that right? Trees aren't sitting there thinking, oh, I really need to produce an orange, you know, and then bang, there's the orange, right? No. What happens? You have a seed. The seed has the ability within itself to produce what it is. It can't produce anything else than what it is. And therefore, when the season is right, bang, the fruit comes. In the same way as we walk in the Spirit, as we stay connected to the Father, right? Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you stay connected to me, you're going to produce fruit. Therefore, as we walk in the Spirit with our children... Hello, we're talking about parenting. As we walk in the Spirit with our children, the natural product of our walking in the Spirit will be love for our children. will be joy with our children. will be long-suffering with our children. Can I get an amen in that one? <laughs> Hallelujah, because we all need that from time to time. So tonight, I, I thought it'd be neat to see what fruitful parenting looks like. A couple of things that, that I want to pull out. Now, we could have gone to nine things, obviously. We could have just, just hit all nine of them, but we don't have the time for that tonight. So I chose a couple of statements, and as we go through, I believe it will cover most of the nine, if not all nine, as we go through some thoughts about fruitful parenting. Fruitful parenting, number one, is faithful parenting. Okay, now if you notice up on the overhead, if you're taking notes, I, I, I put in quotation marks up there, faith. Fruitful parenting is faithful parenting. Pastor Jim made this statement, and uh, he said it to me numerous times in my house with my children present uh, here from this pulpit. He said this, but the greatest tool you will ever have in raising your kids is faith. Let me say that again. The greatest tool you will ever have in raising your children is faith. In other words, I, I, I reckon this. I, I reason this out. I calculated this for myself. I was thinking about it. Who's going to take care of my children better, me or God? Anybody want to answer that? God. Of course, God's going to take better care of my children. Why? Because he's God, right? Because I'm a man. I, I'm in flesh still. I'm still learning. I'm still walking this thing out, still growing in the ways of God. So therefore, if God is the perfect father, then I need to trust God that he knows what he's doing. When God gave me a girl and two boys, I got to trust God that he knew what he was doing when he delivered those souls to me with their unique personalities, with their unique design and makeup, with, with their unique abilities, with their unique time right when they came. I've got to trust that God knows what he's doing. And if he knit these children together in their mother's womb, then God can take care of them. Now, that doesn't take any responsibility off me. I still have to be a man of God. I still have to be a father. I still have to be the head of my house. I still have to provide. I still have to walk in the spirit. I still have to do a lot of different things. I still have to be there for my children. I can't be absentee and just say, oh, God will take care of them. No, but my faith is not in myself. My confidence is not in myself. My, my ability is not coming from just me on the inside. No, I am faithful to God and faith filled with God. That what God has to say. God can raise our children better than we can. See, if you're walking in the Spirit, then the Spirit can whisper in your ear and He can say, hey, listen, this is what you need to do right now. Can't tell you how many times the Spirit's whispered in my ear through my wife. You know, I'll be sitting there, I'll be getting frustrated with something that the children are doing and she'll say, honey, calm down, okay? Thank you, I needed that, right? Or, or how about this one? 
Dan, he doesn't need you to yell at him. He needs a hug, okay? Because I've got, I've got little ones right now, you know? And so I'm, I'm in the midst of this, still, still going through this. See, God will whisper in your heart times the things that your children need. There's been times where I, I've just thought about my children and just, just been like, man, Lord, I, I, I can't do this, you know? But, but God, you can. You know, a great example of this is, is if your child has ever gotten sick. You know, the moment your little one gets the sniffles as a baby, you just want to rip your heart out and give it to them. Why? Because I will do anything as long as you don't hurt. You know, one time my, my son, uh, he cut his hand on the back of a, one of our chairs. We have a leather chair, and he got back behind it, and it's a recliner. So he pulled back on the leather to recline the chair because that was like his little tent area, you know. And in doing so, it pulled the, the nails out of the back of the chair. And when he reached back again to pull it further, the nail just ripped right through his finger. So we took him to the hospital, took him to urgent care. And I remember my wife was just praying, Lord... You know, you can't heal them. You cannot heal your, your child. She said, God, you're going to have to come in and you're going to have to do something. And right when she got into the doctor's office, they started doing the examination. He fell asleep. Is this right? Fell asleep. And they said that the most painful part of the whole procedure would be when they numbed it with the, with the, you know, the needle and all that kind of stuff. And while they're pushing the needle in and putting all that stuff in there to numb it, that was the most painful part of the whole process. He was dead off asleep. Sawn logs. Just, and they sewed them all up, and then afterwards he woke up. Is that, is that not true, Jess? See, it's, that's an amazing story. What has happened? See, God knows what he's doing, and God can take better care of our children than we can. We have to be faith-filled and faithful in our parenting. I, I think about the father of faith in the Bible. We get a great example of this in a, in a guy by the name of Abraham. God wanted to reveal his counsel to Abraham, but it, it's so interesting when you take a look at the qualification of Abraham's trustworthiness. Because when you take a look at what that was, that God could call Abraham his friend and God could entrust to Abraham the desires of his heart. Should I go and do this without first telling Abraham? What was the qualifications? It was how Abraham managed his family. Let's take a look at it together in the book of Genesis, chapter number 18. Genesis chapter number 18, you can turn there with me and take a look at it in your Bible. I'm going to read it to you out of the contemporary English Bible. I like the way that it, it explained it, but you can read along in your Bible and see how it's different and see how it explains it. But I thought this was so powerful to see that the fact that God knew he could trust Abraham, knew that he could deliver to Abraham his counsel, knew that Abraham was faithful, was because God was watching Abraham at home with his wife and with his child. Let's take a look at it together. Genesis chapter 18, verse number 19. Contemporary English Bible. I have formed a relationship with him. This is God speaking to Abraham. I have formed a relationship with him so that he will instruct his children and his household after him. And they will keep to the Lord's path, being moral and just, so that the Lord can do for Abraham everything he said he would. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that powerful that God... When he looks at our lives, if he wants to see faithfulness, because when you take a look at the, the list of the fruit of the Spirit, right, the old King James says faith, new King James says faithfulness. Really, it's the word pistis, meaning faith, what you believe. So God says what you believe will be acted out first and foremost when he's looking at your life and looking to see if you're faithful, looking to see if you're faith-filled, he's going to take a look at your family. He's going to take a look and see how you're treating your wife, how you're treating your husband, and how you're treating your Little ones, your children. And God says, if you can properly steward that and you can be faithful in those things, then I can entrust you my heart, my secret, my counsel, and I can do for you everything I have said I would. See, there's a lot of promises in this book. Lots of promises. I've heard it said that there's a promise for every day. Probably more when you really take a look at it. And when you take a look at everything that God says he would do, how much more should we be faithful in our homes? You want to have a great family? You want to have kids that are raised up in the way of the Lord, serving the Lord? It's time to get in faith. It's time to believe God. It's time to entrust them to God. You know, for, for the uh, parents here that have young adults, you know, sometimes I, I, I came up with this when I led the young adults ministry for seven years. Uh, I, I encountered a lot of parents of 20-somethings. 
and 30-somethings. And those parents were saying, you know, they're not doing what they should be doing. They're, they're smoking weed. They're, they're just a lazy bum. They won't get a job. They're sleeping around this and that. And I say to them, you know, kick them out. Don't let them do that under your roof. Well, well but, 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 well, let, it's time, you know, come on. They're in their 20s. And if they're not going to do what you told them to do, it's time to. Now, that sounds harsh to some parents, and they say, but if I do that, that's going to devastate them. They don't have a job. They're going to end up under a bridge somewhere. They're going to be a derelict of society. Listen, do you trust God with your children? Because if you do then they're not going to end up under the bridge. They're going to realize mom and dad weren't so dumb after all, and I should have listened to what they had to say. And, and, and guess what? They, they probably do know something about life because look at how they're living. Listen, even the prodigal came to himself when he was staring at the pig food going, man, that looks good. Man, that looks good. What, did he, what was his first thought? I can go back to dad. See, parents, don't get discouraged if your child is having a hard time. Trust them to the Lord. When your teenager comes to you and tells you what they're doing, right? Trust the Lord with your teenager. Trust the Lord with your toddler. Trust the Lord with your, uh, you know, with your children. Whatever age that they're in, listen, God knows how to get a hold of them. God knows how to raise them up. You do your part. God does his part. And listen, your, your natural with God super on it becomes a supernatural parenting experience. But it takes faith. It takes faith. When we're faithful, we'll become fruitful. Can you say amen? amen? Okay. Fruitful parenting, number one, is faithful parenting. Fruitful parenting, number two, let's love guide the way. Fruitful parenting, number two, let's love guide the way. Notice that in, in Galatians chapter number five, verse number 22, it starts out that the fruit of the Spirit is... Love. Very first thing right off the bat that you're going to produce as you walk in the Spirit is love. Not just any love, not just worldly love, but agape love. What does that mean? See, there's a bunch of words in the Greek language for love. There's eros, there's phileo, there's, there's all sorts of different types of love. Even in our society, we may have one word for love, but many diverse uses for love. So if we define love however we feel or whatever we think, we're going to get the wrong result. In other words, we're going to get the wrong fruit produced. It'll be bad fruit. We have to define love by what the Bible defines love as in order to say that we're going to let love lead the way. And I believe that as we walk in love, this agape love, which really is the God kind of love, it's a supernatural love. It's a love that's unconditional. It's not based on feelings or circumstances or emotions. It's based on the love of God because God is love. God is agape, the Bible says. And so therefore, if we're walking in the Spirit, the Spirit is God Himself. God is the Spirit, right? So if we're walking in the Spirit, then we're walking in love. And therefore, out of that love will produce every other fruit. Joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, faith. All that other stuff will flow through our life as we walk in the love of God. So we have to let love lead the way. But we've got to define what love is. But we don't define it the way the world defines it. We've got to define it the way the Bible defines it. Is that right? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's go to the love chapter. Some of you guys knew we were going there. The love chapter. But think about this as we read it. I know we've, we've read this. I know we've even put our names in it, you know. Dan is patient. Dan is kind. Dan is not rude. Dan holds no record of wrongs. 1 Corinthians 13. But think about this as a, as a parent. Think about this when looking at your children. Okay? If you can picture them in your mind, think about them as we read this. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 4 through verse number 7. I got a different translation up on the overhead. Let me read it 4 through 7 just in the New King James first. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Eight, chapter, uh, verse number eight, love never fails. Let's stop right there. I'm going to put it up on the overheads for you in the message. 
in the message paraphrase. Okay, I like the way that it said this. Think about your children, okay? You can just look up on the overheads and read along. Love never gives up. How often as parents do we say, ah, that's it, I give up. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. In other words, if you're going to be a parent and you're going to operate in love and let love lead the way, you've got to be selfless. Did you know that parenting is a crash course in selflessness? That's why God gave us babies first. Can I explain that to you? Because the babies are so cute and so helpless that you have to be selfless and you don't care because they're so cute, right? Oh, they can't clean themselves. They can't bathe themselves. They can't feed themselves. They can't, they can't even sleep through the night yet. So you are deprived of everything the moment you become a parent that you once enjoyed. Why? Because it's a crash course in becoming selfless so that when the child gets older, you are already accustomed to being that way. And it's no longer about me or my time or my movie or my show or my thing. No, God has entrusted a life to you that is moldable and shapeable. And if you are selfish with your children, you're going to raise selfish little kids. But if you are selfless with their, your children, just like we discussed last week, they will not become what you say. They will become what you are. Wow. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. It does not envy. Love doesn't strut. Love doesn't have a swelled head. Doesn't force itself on others. Isn't always me first. Doesn't fly off the handle. I love that. I love that. See, I love the, the modern day translations because we, we oftentimes walk into a room of chaos with our children running around or swinging from the, the chandeliers or whatever it is, you know, and we fly off the handle, right? I have done that so many times. There have been times where I've been driving trying to complete a sentence with my wife. Anybody ever miss completing sentences? Parents of young children, can you say amen to that, right? And we're all, glory to God, pastor. I used to love those days where I could finish a thought, right? In your middle of a sentence, and you've said the sentence like six times. Well, by the seventh time, you know, you've reached the number that you're supposed to forgive your brother. And so you just, what, fly off the handle? Would you kids just let me finish my sentence? Right? You're in the car, your arm is back there swinging, and you're just hoping you hit something. You don't care what. Don't act so holy. You know you've done it. You say, Pastor, how do you know about that? Because I've been... Our big thing is, you know, with spankings, right? Everybody says, oh, spanking's so bad. Spank no, listen, don't abuse your children, okay? The, 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 actually, the state of California says you can swat your children on the butt with a, with a hand, and, and you can do that to your child as a discipline as long as you don't leave a mark. Bible says that you are to use a small little twig, right? And, and all that does, you just give them a little swat across the backside right there, just a little quick little whoosh, right? Doesn't leave any bruising, doesn't leave a mark, and all it does is it gives just a little sting, that little shock and awe, you know, a little just enough to snap them out of it, okay? So when we're driving now, you know what we say now that our kids are getting a little bit older? We say, do you guys see the trees around here? <laughs> I will pull this car over, and that's a, see that one right? That's a good tree. <laughs> we just have to be careful when we're driving through the desert. Doesn't fly off the handle. Doesn't keep score of sins of others. Keeps no record of wrongs, some translation says. See, children are children. Thank God for verse number 11. Don't you just love verse number 11 that when I was a child, I acted like a child, I thought like a child, I understood like a child, but then when I grew up, I put away childish things. See, there's hope for your children. Don't hold their wrongs over their heads. Don't keep that record of wrongs. The moment they repent, the moment they ask for forgiveness, and the moment you say, I forgive you, let's wipe that away like Jesus did, all right? Now, I understand trust and, and, and that sort of a thing that needs to be built, and we understand that, but we're not, next time they mess up, we're not pulling out the list and saying, hey, you did that last week. Can we, can we just add another check, you know, add another? No, let's, let's, let's praise Let's reward, let's encourage, let's not discourage and hold things over their head. If you've forgiven them and they've repented of it, let's move on. Now, when they do it again, what do you do? You have the discussion, right? And, and you don't hold it over their head. You say, we did, just dealt with this, and you know, right? Okay, that's okay. That's not keeping a record of wrongs. That's reminding them 
of something so that you can just make some headway and say, are, are, you know you're wrong, right? You know you just did it again. And the, and the consequences that come with that action, okay? So don't just say it and don't do it. You've got to do it. You've got to make sure that, you know, you're, you're not just threatening the spanking, you know, and if you do that one more time, oh, you, they did it. Oh, 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 one more time. No, no, if you said it, go do it. There have been times where I've had to discipline to my own hurt. And I have understood what was said. It, this hurts you more than it does me, son, right? Why? Because it does as a parent. You don't want to do it. But listen, if you don't, the kid's going to learn that I can still push further. I can still, and they're, they're creating boundaries, that sort of a thing. So don't keep the record of wrongs. Now, that doesn't mean don't discipline and don't follow through and follow up and remind and that sort of a thing that we're, we're not going to go there. But this is not every time they mess up, check. Oh, loser, check, oh, you know, dirty, check, you know, and, and, you, and you hold that over their head. That's going to shame that child. You don't want to do that. Doesn't revel when others grovel. Takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. Puts up with anything. Trusts God always. There's that faith again. Always looks for the best. Look for the best in your children. Call it out in them. I tell you, my wife and I are our children's biggest cheerleaders. You want to know why? Because our parents are our biggest cheerleaders. And what they have poured into us, now we are pouring into our children. And so, you know what? Our children may draw something. And, you know, it may look like a pancake that just got muddied up on the freeway. And they come to me and say, Daddy, look. And I go, honey, that looks so beautiful. What is it? You know, and, and the neat thing is, is their, their imaginations go crazy. My son comes home with these little uh, people, right? He's got these little strips of paper. I guess they give them to him here at the school. And he's got these big, long strips. And they got people. And there's some angry people. And there's some things here. And there's this and that. And then there's blood over here. And at first, you know, you're looking at it. And you're going, oh, my gosh. I'm going to have to get counseling for my child. <laughs> right? Because you're wondering what all these angry people are and the blood and this and that. And, and, and then I go to him and I say, honey, um... What is this? And he says, oh, let me see here. And he starts looking, at, and, and literally my son is this way. Let me see here. Okay, that is, uh, that's the, the upper room. There's the disciples having the last supper. Jesus is washing all the feet of the disciples. Then here he goes. He's getting beaten. The, the, there's the crown of thorns. There he is on the cross. And it's like, oh, my goodness, this boy understands the gospel. But see, you can call that out in your children when they start showing interest in something, when they start showing attention somewhere, uh, as, even as adults. You know, uh, the neat thing about the adult life is that it's kind of like back when you were a child. And here's how I mean that. I used to call our, our young adults time, the time of the junior high of the adult life. Let me explain that to you. Because when your adult children finish high school, maybe finish college, and they move out and that sort of a thing, there's no one telling them what to do anymore. There's no one telling them you have to go to church anymore. There's no one holding up standards over them. When they're at home, they have character built into them from where they've come from. And they have the ability to make choices. And now they're going to make some right choices, some wrong choices. But listen, it's awkward. It's a tough time in life. Some of you guys remember being that way and being, being out there on your own for the first time, paying bills for the first time. Some of you guys remember making the mistake of, oh my goodness, I forgot to pay the water bill and the water got turned off, you know? Some of you guys made the mistake of hanging out with the wrong people. Some of you guys made the mistake of going towards the wrong career because you thought it was a get-rich-quick thing and you didn't realize what the Bible says, little by little, it's built up over time right? And so you, 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 you know that arena. And so with your young adult children, those of you that, that are older that have young adult children, be patient with them. Encourage them. When they start showing interest in something, hey, call it out in them. You can do it. Why not go for the better position? Why not go for the better job? Why not finish college? Why not go and get your education? Why not go and get the certificate? Why not go and start a business? Why not go and do something for God? Why not be a missionary? Why not go to Bible college here at The Rock? Why why not? What can't God do? And start to call it out in them. Start to draw that out of them and encourage and build up your children. Always look for the best. Never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never fails. My goodness. So cool. So cool. In the New King James Version, it says that love suffers long and is kind. See, two more fruits just by operating love. Love suffers long. There's that long suffering, but also 
it's kind. See, something that helps me to be long-suffering is to remember that they're, they're kids, you know? Uh, there have been times where I've talked to my wife and we've been getting mad at the children and all of a sudden we kind of stop and we say, wait, 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 wait. We're arguing with a two-year-old right now. Do you realize that we are arguing with a two-year-old? In the same way with your children, whatever age range they are, remember where they're at in life. Remember where you were, you know? Some of us, even 20, even 30, we were crazy, right? So be long-suffering. Bear with one another as God also bared with us in Christ Jesus. What about kindness? I like how kindness is defined in the New Spirit-Filled Life Bible. Uh, the ability, you got to get a hold of this. This is so cool. Kindness. The ability to act for the welfare of those who are taxing your patience. Doesn't that sound like parenting right there? The ability to act for the welfare of those who are taxing your patience. I mean, children have a way of just taxing your patience. They get on your last nerve. You all know what I'm saying tonight. But listen, if you can act for their welfare, even when they're screaming, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. I know you've been saying that for the last 30 minutes. I've got stuff in the oven right now. If you will just wait. <laughs> but to act for their welfare, to be long-suffering, to be patient, to be kind. Kindness, such a great thing. We need to do more of that. How about this? Being gentle with our children. You know, as adults, sometimes we can be rough, especially us men. Can I talk to the men for a second? I... I I firmly believe that every boy definitely needs a man to wrestle with him, you know, to, to play fight and punch, you know, to, to buy him his first toy gun and, and you know, go shoot stuff and it, all that kind of stuff. I, I'm not one of those parents that says don't give him anything violent. You know, boys want to be adventurers. They want to be the hero and that sort of a thing. So that's, that's cool. Call that out in him because when he goes up against the devil and when he goes up against hard times in life, he needs to know how to fight. He needs to know how to be the hero. He needs to know how to trust God in the face of danger. See, there's things that you can call out inside of that young male child, but at the same time, even your little boy needs a hug from dad. Even your little boy needs gentleness at times. There's times where you need to be tender. I, I can be the roughest one in our family on our boys, especially when they're doing wrong. And my wife sometimes comes up behind me and, and, and kind of pulls in the reins and says, honey, listen, listen, they don't need your shouts right now. They need your love. Go give them a hug. Go let them sit in your lap. Go just, just hold them for a little while. Just let them, it, it, it'll be fine. It'll be cool. In the same way, your daughters, daddies, need hugs. They need love. They need kisses. They need to be taken out. They need to be treated special. They, they need you to open the door for them. That sort of a thing. Moms, hey, they need you to come and show them how to live life, how to, how to do the things that you do that only mom can do. Mom has a way of making stuff special. Mom has a way of celebrating. My daughter is constantly watching my wife and looking to see how she can do something, how she can make something special, how she can love someone. I mean, it's just a neat thing to see from a very young age how my daughter responded to my, my wife. And now my daughter is almost like the one-upper, you know, where we're like, hey, you know, it's so-and-so's birthday. And she'll come in with like a card and, you know, a whole plan like, okay, we're going to go surprise them. And we're like, honey, no, they live in Nebraska. We can't do that, you know. But, but it's so neat to see how as parents... We can raise up our children to be unselfish, to be, uh, to be kind, to be gentle, to be all walking in the fruits of the Spirit of God. You guys good? Okay, last one for tonight. Last one for tonight. One more, okay? One more. This is the last one for tonight. Is don't lose sight of joy and peace. Whatever walk of your parenting experience that you're in, some of you guys in here are empty nesters, but you still have children out there and you've lost the joy of parenting. Some of you guys don't have any peace when it comes to your children. You're looking at where they're at in life. Don't lose sight of that fruit of the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Allow God to show you the joy. Maybe the joy is just in the, in the, in the memories. Maybe the joy is, is where you remember those things and you, you come back to those things. Listen, God made those children, and even though they may not have turned out how you wanted them to, God still knows the path. God still knows the plan. God's not finished with anyone on this earth yet. And so you can rejoice that God is good and that God has a plan. You can have peace. You can rest in God knowing that he will take care of your children. That goes back to number one, faith, right? That God can raise your children better than you can raise them. So don't lose sight of the joy and the peace. There's a joy in parenting. But when you lose your joy, it becomes a grind. 
Parenting can be tough, especially at, at the young ages, you know, where my wife and I are at right now. Sometimes there's monotonous things that you just got to do. I never pictured myself sitting down and doing long division with my children. I can lose my joy at times there at the dinner table when we're trying to do long division, carry over remainders and do all that kind of stuff. You know, maybe you're one of those parents that you're going on YouTube trying to figure out how to do algebra again. Listen, don't lose your joy. All right, enjoy the adventure, you know. Uh, call that stuff out in your children again when they start getting discouraged. Enjoy it. You have to learn to laugh. You know, there's, there's, there's times where, yes, you have to be stern, and yes, you have to say, hey, listen, I told you if that happened, this was going to be this way. But listen, learn to laugh. My wife and I, there's times where even in the middle of disciplining our children where we told them, you, you better not, you know. And especially our little guy. Our little guy's like the comedian of the house. At the dinner table, he'll kind of stand up at his chair you know, like almost like, all right, everybody, the show's about to begin. You know, can I have your attention, please, right over here? And all of a sudden, he'll be cracking us up. You know, he's sitting there dancing, just like he'll hold the table sometimes and clench his teeth and be like, just to make us laugh. And so we, we just have a good time. And my, uh, my other son, he just thinks he's the funniest thing ever, you know. So he's uh, just like busting up laughing there, rolling on the, uh, off, off the table, you know, and on the ground and stuff. But it's a good time. But there's sometimes where we're like, hey, you better, you better stop messing around. You better eat, you know. And then he'll do something funny. And it's like, what do you do when you're disciplining and they're just stinking cute? You know, they're just so funny. So my wife and I will be like, listen, you better not do that again. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, you know, you go back to it. Listen, it's okay to laugh. It's okay to have fun. It's okay to enjoy your children. It's okay to, to laugh with them. See, some people say, I, I hated growing up, you know. Listen, I never did. So, you know, I'm still in there watching the movies with them. I really enjoyed the Lego movie recently. I don't know if you saw that. If you didn't, don't worry about it. But, you know, go and have fun with your kids. It's okay to be a big kid with your children. Yes, you'll, you'll have plenty of time to be the adult and to be the parent, to be the disciplinarian, but don't lose the joy. And also stay in the peace of God. See, sometimes we run everywhere we want for peace. If, if you didn't get a hold of Wednesday night's teaching, then, then get a hold of that. And then come this coming Wednesday night. Pastor Jim's going to uh, drop on us some more wisdom about peace. But, but listen, don't run around looking for peace anywhere but in God. See, sometimes we, we, we run for solitude. You know, i got to get away. i got to get alone. i got to you know, just have some peace. And we think that that's going to cause peace. It doesn't. You just sit there and think about everything wrong in your life, you know. And, and, and guess what? You can't really get away anyways because even if you go to the bathroom, the kids are there with their fingers under the door. You know, Mommy! Daddy! Anybody ever been hunted down by the children, right? You're hiding in the closet eating your candy bar because you don't want them to have any. You know you did it eating the ice cream after they go to bed and they come down. I gotta have a drink of water. <gasps> you're eating ice cream? I want ice cream. No. <laughs> Bother me, kid. Go to bed. Stay at peace when your teen tells you what they did wrong. Stay at peace when the young adult calls you and says they messed up. Stay at peace. Stay at peace. Stay in the peace of God. And like I said, get some great teaching on that Wednesday nights. Stick, stick with goodness. Stick with the fruit of goodness. What is that? Virtue equipped for action. I love that. The goodness of God ready to be displayed. Jesus said we know how to give good gifts to our children. When they ask you for something, don't give them a smack in the head. Don't give them a rock. Don't give them a snake. Don't give them something evil. Give them what they need. Give them Jesus. Give them the word of God. Give them encouragement. Give them love. Give them faith. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, you're there in 1 Corinthians. Turn there with me. Last verse for tonight. I had to use this verse before uh, next week because I believe Pastor Mike and Sue are coming up next week. You guys up next week? Yeah? And, and I figured they were going to use this verse, so I, I thought I'd use it first. <laughs> Didn't want them to steal my verse. Ephesians 6, verse 4. You can use it again, I, I guess. Ephesians 6, 4. Look at this. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Amplified Bible says don't irritate them. See... 
again, with the big kid thing, sometimes it's good to be a big kid, sometimes it's not good because I can get in there with my kids and I can run them ragged with pestering. I can be the biggest, most stubborn jerk on the face of the planet. And, and for some reason, with our children, we think that that's okay. You know, it's almost like, well, they're mine. I can pester them, you know. They're mine. I can, I can, I can push the red button as many times as I want to. But when your children start to turn on you and start screaming at you, it's, it's, you've, you've gone across the line. The Bible says, you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but look at this, bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. In the old King James Version, instead of training, it says to nurture, to nurture. Remember, we talked about that you need to be gentle with them. The message says, take them by the hand and lead them in the way of the master. See, children need a, a soft, gentle, loving, caring touch at any age. Admonish, I like admonish, that's a good word admonishment of the Lord, the admonition of the Lord. We might say, well, that means you just talk to them about God. No, admonishment is something else. I looked up the definition of admonishment, and I actually was, was pleasantly surprised at what it said because it meant something that, that many of us as parents kind of shy away from. But really, it's something good for us to do. Admonish means to warn or reprimand firmly of something to be avoided. See, as parents, we need to be in our kids' faces at times. Had a woman this morning came to me at the uh, right back there in the back of the auditorium, and she said, "Pastor Dan, do you remember when you preached that sermon on why me?" And and actually, I, I did. You know, and there's preached a lot of sermons around here, but I remember that series. And I said, "Yes, I do remember preaching that." And praise God, you know, I remembered something. So she goes, "Yeah, you know, during that time, you said that we as parents shouldn't let our children tell us whether or not they're going to go to church." And no, I don't remember saying that. I'm, I remember the Why Me series is something totally different. But she heard the word of the Lord to her heart that she needed to tell her children they're going to church, that they didn't get the option to sit on the couch. They didn't get the option to sleep in. They didn't get the option to stay home. So she had her daughter right there with her. She says, this is my daughter. She used to stay at home and tell me she didn't want to go, and I let her. But then finally, after you said that during that series, I said, no, you're going to church. And she says, guess what? She liked it. She says, guess what? She went to youth conference. I looked at her daughter. I said, did you enjoy it? She says, oh, yeah, it was so fun. See? As parents, we feel bad. You may feel bad as the parent warning your young adult that, hey, if you continue to smoke pot and sleep around and do all that under my roof, I'm going to kick you out. You might feel bad about that. But it's okay. You are called to train them, take them by the hand and lead them in the way of the master. But listen, at that age, you need to admonish them more. You need to admonish them. You need to get in their face and tell them, this is how it's going to be. You're under my roof. You're eating my food. You're going to serve my God. You're going to go to my church. That's just how it goes. And if they don't want to do it, there's the door. You can go find your own way. And listen, trust God that God will take care of them in their wandering because you can call them back to their borders. They will come back and listen. They will remember that you had it together like we already discussed. Colossians says the same thing that it says in Ephesians, only it says, lest they become discouraged. See, if we continue to provoke our children to wrath, they'll get discouraged and they'll push away. We should not be discouraging our children. We should be encouraging our children, encouraging our children, encouraging our children. What does that mean? That means adding courage to them for life. You can do it. Come on, God has called you. You are chosen of the Lord. God has great plans for you. You have a purpose here on the planet. God loves you. God will take care of you. God can do it. Come on, let's go, child. One more fruit, temperate, temperate. One more fruit for tonight, temperate. Pastor Luke mentioned this, and I thought it was worth mentioning again. You as a parent are temperate. What does that mean? You think of temperature, maybe of a, of a gauge in your home. We talked about it's warm in here tonight. There's a temperature gauge. There's a thermostat that controls the environment of the room. You as a parent control the environment of your home. You as a parent, as you walk in the spirit, you set the tone for how your house is going to be. Don't let the children come and, and cause chaos and confusion and do whatever they want to do with your house. You control, as the parent, the temperature of your home. You can either heat it up, you can cool it down, you can keep it cool, you can do whatever you want to do. But listen, keep it with the word of the Lord. Fruitful parenting, what did we learn tonight? We learned fruitful parenting, number one, is faithful parenting. Number two, we learned that fruitful parenting lets love guide the way. And number three, we learned that fruitful parenting doesn't lose sight of joy and peace. Did you get something from the word of God tonight? God is so good. Come on, let's give God a great big praise. Hallelujah.
Hey, you guys have been great tonight. I want to thank you guys for sitting through that, even especially with the temperature a bit up. You know, we're a bunch of big babies. We can sit in, in some temperature. I, I heard of people walking for days in Africa to hear the word of the Lord. We can sit in a warm church service. All right. Let me talk to you guys. Give me a couple more minutes of your time, then I'm going to let you go. I want to make sure before you leave this place that your heart's right with God. It'd be a tragedy if we came into the house of God had such a good time like we did. You left this place, got in your car, and your heart stopped, and you died, and you didn't go to heaven. That'd be a tragedy. Listen, I don't want that. You don't want that. And God especially doesn't want that for your life. God does not want you to end up, after all is said and done here on the earth, to end up in hell. God wants you in heaven with him. He created you to be with him. And yet God is so good and so loving, so just, that he allows us to choose with our life where we go. Now sometimes say people, people say to me, you know, I don't believe in hell. Well, that's convenient, but you know what? It's not good. It's not safe. It's not right. You know why? Because the Bible talks about hell in the Old and the New Testament. Jesus himself spoke of hell. It's a very real place. You're not going to avoid it just by burying your head in the sand. Come on, let's talk about your eternal life. I'm going to ask everybody to remain seated during this time. Give me a couple more minutes, then I'll let you go. We'll dismiss in a couple minutes here. Sometimes people say, well, Pastor, all roads lead to heaven. You know, I, I, I do my thing, you do your thing. As long as we stay true to ourselves, we're cool. That, that church group can do their thing, and, you know, this church says their, whatever, you know, as long as they stay true to themselves. God sees that and lets them into heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say stay true to yourself? You get to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say all roads lead to heaven. It's like saying all roads lead to the moon. You can't get there any other way but one way. In the same way, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Sometimes people think God's way is just by being good. You know, if you're good enough that you get into heaven. Or if your good outweighs your bad that you get to go to heaven. Well, listen, did you know that nowhere in the Bible say you can be good enough? In fact, the Bible says that our goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags. Not going to make it. Nowhere in the Bible say be this good or let your good outweigh your bad, and God sees that and lets you into heaven. Not about being good because your goodness won't match up. And the Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not going to make it there based on your goodness or on your own merit. Sometimes people say, but pastor, I was raised in church. Parents told me you were Christians growing up. They hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? You, you were raised in religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. And, and you were born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible to say that you're raised in church, parents tell you you're Christian growing up, you get to go to heaven? Nor in the Bible say you wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, attend religious classes, or be born in America, that gets you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. And nowhere, check it out, nowhere in the Bible does it say, because you're not some other religion that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven. Come on, let's talk about your eternal life tonight. Some of you might be thinking, well, pastor, you know, not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I'm sitting in church tonight, right here in front of you sitting in this church service, endured the heat, and I'm sitting right here. Well, hey, listen, that's great. I'm glad you're doing that, but could you show that to me in the Bible? Because it's not there. Nowhere. Check it out. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. It's like saying I could go to my garage, sit in my garage, call myself a car, and that makes me a car. No. Nope. can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. You might be thinking, but pastor, hold on a second. Wait, because my last church, I got involved. I helped out. I Heard the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. Got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did that. But just show that to me in the Bible where your church involvement gets you into heaven. It doesn't work. Your church involvement won't get you into heaven. God's not looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. Now, you might be thinking, but I know God. Someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know about Jesus about to celebrate Easter and the resurrection, sing the songs at Christmas every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor, Old and New Testament. Now, while that's great and I'm glad you can do those things, could you just show that to me in the Bible? Because if you had read your Bible, you would know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. They know who he is. If you'd read your Bible, you know the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up here at me for a second. Look up here. This is not about what you have in your head. Not about having mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. But rather, this is about your heart. God's always been after your heart. All the way through the Bible, God is looking for your heart. Jesus said, 
to a man who is a religious leader of his day, probably better than all of us in this room, raised in his church, involved, you know, one of the leaders of his day, who we would have thought was headed for heaven. Jesus doesn't pat him on the back and congratulate him for his life. No, he says, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. I know they've raked it through the coals and made it out to be something that it's not. But this is not about what society says. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot, or I want to find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he talking about? Lukewarm, what's that? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because think about it. Only people that are not real Christians would be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus made this statement. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. In a moment, I'm going to go like this. One, two, three. Bang! Pop my hands together on the count of three. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. And you might be thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. Let's get over that tonight. You just think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to... Spend eternity in hell away from God forever and ever and ever and ever. No one would make that trade. And yet tonight, your flesh is going to try and talk you out of it. Oh, you'll be embarrassed. The devil's going to try and push you out of it. Don't do it. This is not real. You can't. Right? Listen, push past that tonight. Let's go for God. I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count and put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed. But even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. Now listen. No one's judging you. No one's criticizing you. No one's condemning you. The people you came with, they want you to do this. In fact, we've all done it at one time or another, in one way or another. Tonight, it's your turn. Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight is your night. Make sure. Who should raise their hand? If you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus. Come on, tonight you can give them all of your heart and all of your life. And finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Get ready to get right with God. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together all, all across the auditorium, back in the families, wherever you're at. If you're watching by television in the foyer of the Love Rock Cafe, you can lift your hand, then tell an usher coming in the church service right afterwards. Online, wherever you're at, you can raise your hand. And then on our homepage, you can click Respond to God. Or if you see that blue button there to, to respond to God, you can do that right now. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One. Two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Eight. Got you. Nine up there. Who else today? Nine wise people already. Got about nine. Thank you. Ten over there. Got you. Got you. Anybody else that I didn't already see? Ten, eleven. Got you up there on top. Thank you. Number eleven. Where you at? Number twelve. Over here. Where you at? Oh, got you right there. Thank you. Thank you, number twelve. Got you over there. Anybody else? There's about a dozen wise people. God doesn't thank you, number 13. God bless you. I got you right there. Come on, I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. This is your time. Let's get right with God. Thank you. I, I think I already got that hand. Go ahead. You can put it down on the back there. Thank you so much. Anybody else real quick? About 13 wise people. About 13 wise people. If you're number 14, number 15, you're sitting there wondering if you should. Come on. Yeah. You should. Go for it. That's you today. Anybody else? Come on. Just pop it up high for me. Anybody else? It's your last call. I'm going to close it up in a moment. Don't miss this opportunity. You've missed enough opportunities in your life. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. Let's give the Lord a great big praise for about 13 wise people. Hallelujah. All right. All 13 of you, or if you're number 14 and 15, you thought you missed out. Hey, 
It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand, give a clap and a shout just for you. That's your cue to get hold of your, I don't know if you brought a coat tonight. Maybe you did, but get your stuff. Purse, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Get your stuff. Get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies here tonight. Can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you. You raise your hand or you should have raised your hand. You get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet us up front right now. Come on, let's stand and welcome them. You come right now. Come on down. Come on down. Come and let's give him a hand as they come. They're still coming. Come on, let's give him a great big praise as they come tonight. All right, they're still coming. Come on, you can come too. We'll wait for you. Come on down right now. Even if you didn't raise your hand, just get your stuff, get in the alley, come on down. All right, all right, praise God. Hey, everybody, looking up. Look at you guys. This is awesome. This is awesome. Came to give God all your heart, came to give God all of your life. Best decision of your entire life. I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine. Right over here to my right and left. See this guy in the black coat, black shirt? This is Pastor Joel. Real good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. He's going to give you some free information, some free literature to find out what to do next in your walk with God. He's going to introduce you to a program we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Let me break it down for you. It's a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. So you don't go back serving the devil in your old ways. You go on serving the Lord, okay? It's easy, it's free, and you need to do it. He'll describe how it works, and then he'll let you come right back out. So if you guys want to make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel, right this way, let's give him a hand. Right this way, guys, follow Pastor Joel. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise tonight. Woo! Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.